G'day everyone, today we've got a fun one. That's right, we're finally assembling our robot. We're gonna go from having all our components sprawled out on the bench, to designing a chassis and putting all the components inside it, to having it be able to drive around and look at things, that kind of fun stuff. Now, it's gonna be exciting to dive into this, but before we do, there's just a couple of other things I wanna fix up that'll be easier to do while we've got it out on the bench. Before we go ahead and start putting everything in the chassis and getting it ready to drive around, it'll be best if we can first test all of the components on the bench working together. Because until this point, we've actually only tested each part individually, not all together. And before we do that, I wanna deal with some power issues. You might remember earlier on in the power video, I mentioned that I wasn't that impressed with the voltage that was coming out of the power supply. And it turns out that's causing some under voltage issues on the Raspberry Pi. So to see that, I've SSH into the Pi here and we're gonna type VC Gen CMD get throttled. And that command there tells us that right now the Pi is under voltage and that's not great. So I'm gonna get out a multimeter so firstly, let's check the voltage that's actually coming out of our regulator. So if I put the probes onto there, see we're getting 4.88 volts. So not fantastic, but not too bad. I'll check here just as we're about to go into the Pi. Again, 4.86, we might have dropped a tiny little bit there, but not too much. But now let's look at the Pi itself. So I'm going to put the meter probes on the leftover ground and voltage pins. And you can see there, we're measuring 4.68 volts. Now, if you remember back over here, we were getting 4.86 volts. So we're dropping about 0.2 volts just within these wires. And that's not great. So there's two ways we're gonna tackle this problem. Firstly, this is a variable voltage regulator. I've currently got the switch set to five volts and that's clearly not enough. So we're gonna use the variable voltage to make the voltage a little bit higher than five volts so we can afford some losses. And secondly, I'm gonna replace this lead with something that can deal with more current. This one says that it's 22 gauge and the RCY connectors should be rated, but clearly we're getting a voltage drop. You can see if I put this across here, we're getting, as expected, about 0.1 volts, and obviously we're gonna have that on both the power and the voltage wires. So let's try those two fixes. I'll start by turning everything off. I might even unplug the battery. We'll get the Pi out of there. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn up this switch to the variable mode, plug the battery back in, turn it on, and now measure the voltage that we're getting out of here. You see it's 5.05, that's because I did this earlier. If I put the screwdriver in here, you can see we can get a huge range of voltages. So you wanna be really careful with it. It's very sensitive. And we're aiming for just a little over five volts. Okay, there we are. I've got 5.15 volts. I really don't like how sensitive that is. I wish it just worked on the, on the five volt mode. But that's good. Now we're ready to put our other cable in for the Pi. Now I'm gonna use one that I've just wired up. I haven't done a great job of it. It'd be quite reasonable to ask what gauge this wire is. And the answer is, I don't know. It's just something that I found in my garage, but it's certainly thicker than what we had before. Um, and I put these little DuPont connectors on the end. I haven't done a very good job of it. I'm gonna try and think of something better, but let's see if this works. So turn it off. Okay, so let's measure the voltage that we're getting across here now. That's about 5.1 volts. So we've got a little bit of a loss in the system here, but that's fine. So 5.1 volts is good. And now let's measure what we're getting across those pins. And look at that, 5.07. So we might be dropping 0.03 volts there, but that's fine. We're still getting five volts at the Pi. You can see this light is staying lit up. Then if we SSH back in again, and we type VC Gen CMD get throttled, we can see zero, that means it's not currently being throttled, and that's great. So let's now put all of our other sensors and everything back into the circuit, and we can check that everything still works before we go put it in the chassis. Okay, so now I've got the 
Pi powered up, I've got the camera plugged in, I've got the motors and the motor driver and all that plugged in, I've got the LiDAR plugged in. I haven't got the depth camera plugged in at the moment, I'm just gonna leave that one for now. Um, and so let's just check that these things still work. So we'll just run through them quickly. So I'll start with the camera. There we go. Now let's check the LiDAR. There we go, so we've got our LiDAR data. Now let's check the motors. So I've only got one motor plugged in at the moment, but if you remember, we've got our serial motor driver. So we'll just source our workspace. And then same here. Now I've only got motor two plugged in at the moment. So if we set that one going, great, our motor spins. So we've got our camera, our LiDAR, our motors working. That means we're ready to package all this up and put it in our chassis. While we're logged in via SSH, there's a couple of other things I want to fix up too. And the first one we'll see is if we type journal CTL FE and look at the system journal, you can see every couple of seconds it's printing out this light DM service failed. And what that is, that's the display manager. So because there's no monitor connected to the Pi at the moment, every few seconds it's trying to restart the display manager and failing. Now that's probably not too big of a problem, but we may as well have it not do that. It's using a bit of extra CPU to, to think about rebooting that all the time. And so there's a few ways we can change that. One way would be to just disable the LightDM service. Um, I've tried that, but apparently that's not the best way to do it. Instead, we're gonna change the systemd target. So when the computer starts up, it uses this thing called systemd, which can start up at a bunch of different levels. And if we look at the current level, we type systemctl get default. And that'll tell us that the current uh, default level is the graphical target. So obviously that's when we've got graphics. Now, when we don't have a monitor plugged in, the next level down is one called multi-user. And that's just the standard level for non-graphical systems. So you can have multiple processes each being executed by multiple different users. That's just the normal thing. So to, to set that, we'll type sudo systemctl set default multi-user.target and you can see it says created symlink now we'll just quickly reboot okay now it's rebooted again we can type system ctl get default we'll see we're now on the multi-user target and if we type journal ctl dash fe you can see we're no longer getting that display manager light DM error popping up every couple seconds. You can see it's actually still starting up some of the other system services there. Now the other thing I want to do is to actually clone my package onto the Pi. Um, you'd think I would have done that at some point in this project so far, but I haven't. So we're going to just hop into our workspace. And then where we've got those other packages there, we want to clone our package. Um, Mine was called Articubot1, yours will be called whatever you called it. Um, and remember to make sure you've got your SSH key registered on GitHub if you haven't already. So git clone git at github.com. And now we can rebuild it with Colcon. And you can see the Articubot1 one has finished. This is just rebuilding that serial motor demo from an earlier tutorial. So that's it. Now let's get to putting our chassis together. Designing the chassis can be a pretty fun and interesting step in the build because it determines the final look and feel of the robot. Your design is going to depend on your needs, making it cheaply, making it easy to modify, making it look nice or something else. You've got so many options. On the cheaper end, you could use some scrap wood, an old plastic container or even some thick cardboard. On the other hand, you could carefully design it in CAD to be 3D printed, laser cut, CNC, routed. It's totally up to you. For this build, I'm going to try and reuse this document filing box. I chose it because compared to other containers I've tried in the past, it's quite rigid even with these big holes in it. I'll make some removable plates to mount the sensors on top and cover the hole, and it also comes fully apart which will make it easier to mount things and to paint. And finally, you can also use it to store all the parts while you're still getting ready. I used Blender to do a quick mock-up of the kind of design I was going for, and the first thing to sort out is the motors. For a differential drive robot, you really want the wheels to be as close to the centre line as possible. That's because it will rotate about the centre of this axis, and so if they're off at one end, it'll swing the whole chassis around. 
This is also a good reason to make your robot circular, or at least square, not rectangular like mine, as it keeps the footprint small. But if you've got your drive wheels in the centre, then you'll need two casters, one at the front and one at the back. And so instead, I'm going to offset my wheels slightly forward and have one caster at the back. It really all depends on the shape and the weight distribution of your chassis, but you can't go too wrong. And I'm going to mount my motors to the top side of the base plate, rather than the bottom. This keeps all of the wiring neatly inside the chassis, but it does mean that it'll have a very low ground clearance. Rather than use the included mounting brackets, I decided to tie them directly to the base plate. This has a lot of play in it, which is why I then also drilled some holes in the top part of the chassis for it to screw into, and that locks the whole thing together really rigidly. For the wheels themselves, I just used the ones that came with the motors. They are a good size fit and have much better traction on smooth surfaces than the other wheels I had. And I also put the caster wheel at the other end at the back. With the holes for the motor mount drilled out, I spray painted it using the cheapest paint I could get. Just a quick tip, if you purchase black paint in an orange can and orange paint in a black and white can, you should pay very careful attention to which can you pick up. If you do want the finish to last, you should prime it and do a few coats. I didn't really mind too much, so I just did it quickly. Next up, we want to attach our circuitry to the bottom of our chassis. Now, since I've got my motors attached near the front, then I'm going to try and keep all the motor circuitry up here at the front, and then I'll keep the pie and the power circuitry and all that up the back. When it comes to how to attach your circuit boards to the chassis, uh, you've got a few different options. The most typical way, I guess, would be to use screws and standoffs. So you'll screw up from the bottom and secure the, the PCBs to the chassis. Um, another good option is double-sided tape for some things like this breadboard. You can see it comes with double-sided tape stuck to the bottom of it. You can also use zip ties in some circumstances. That's what I've got here. Uh, you can get little adhesive PCB standoffs that you can stick to the bottom here and then they'll stick up and the circuit board can sit on top of them. So a whole bunch of options. Another thing you might want to consider is instead of attaching directly to the base plate, you can attach to a piece of sacrificial board and then attach it to the base plate. This can be useful when you're prototyping because uh, rather than making heaps and heaps of holes in your actual base plate, you can make them in the sacrificial board, you can rearrange it, you can do what you want and then secure that to the bottom. I was planning on taking that approach with this one using the bottom of the plastic container that sat inside the main container and so securing everything to that and then being able to slide that in and out easily. But I decided it was going to be too much hassle uh, to be able to take that out every time I wanted to make a change. So I'm going to opt for uh, screwing and sticking directly to the base plate here. I'm going to start by screwing down this guy and sticking down this guy. It's a shame I've already painted this. It means the double-sided sticky tape won't stick quite so well, but it should be fine. Those are installed now. Hopefully you'll do a better job of drilling than I did. Now I'm just going to quickly test my motors. Um, make sure if you do this that you've got it propped up like I have, otherwise it'll fly off on your bench. So let's try left motor forward, left motor backwards, right motor forwards, and right motor backwards. Okay, it was getting a bit late so I decided to finish up for the evening and it's now the next morning. You'd think the next step would be to secure the Pi and the power electronics, but I haven't quite figured out exactly how I want to do that yet, so I'm just going to let them kind of sit in there. And now it's going to be time to put the top of our chassis on. Next, I 3D printed three plates to cover the hole in the top, then some mounting brackets for the camera and LiDAR. Then we've got to pop the wheels on and the back cover on, and we're all good. With all that put together, that means we're now ready to test. Now, I strongly recommend you testing on the floor, not on a workbench like I am. It's just easier for filming. And so let's start by trying to move forward slowly. What about backwards? Let's go a little quicker. Let's try spinning around. And let's spin back the other way. Fantastic. Okay, that's looking pretty good. One thing that's missing compared to my prototype is the screen. I am gonna put one in, but I wanna order a new one and it's not really necessary for the rest of the tutorials. So let's find something else to fill that space in the meantime. A few other little details to note. To keep the pie cool, I added this heat sink enclosure. It's got these little fans to circulate the air, and I made sure to install the camera cable on the Pi now, otherwise it's going to be really hard to get out later. 
I also got a little GPIO header extender, which makes the pins easier to access, but I've decided to leave that off. I think I can access them well enough for now. I did some tests and this definitely keeps the Pi much cooler, which is important inside the chassis. Because the camera cable is inaccessible at both ends, I've instead used two cables and this little joiner, which makes it easier to disconnect. I also mounted the main power switch at the back of the robot, where there's a secondary switch that'll power the Pi itself, but that one's not hooked up yet. I'll save that for another video. I do also plan to make a back cover for this to stop everything falling out. So now we've got all of our components assembled inside our chassis, and that means it's ready to go for the next step, which is ROS2 control. I know a lot of you have been asking about ROS2 control, so make sure you subscribe if you haven't already so that you don't miss out on that one. So ROS2 control is what takes our control input, whether that be from a, a controller or a navigation system, and it calculates using its differential drive controller, the correct steering commands for the wheel. So it's very important. That's what we need to be able to drive it around. As always, if you've got any other questions or comments, let us know below. And otherwise I'll see you next time.